I struggle a bit with my professional identity, not because I really confuse myself with Janet Jackson um, or a performer. Um, I'm trained as a social worker um, and as an academic researcher. Um, and I sort of feel the pull of being a, wanting to be an agent of social change and being a scientist. Um, and, and I think to some extent it's a healthy struggle, but it is a, a struggle that I, um, that I have most days. Um, and the, the tools that I use for my trade, both as a social worker and as a social scientist, um, are maps, um, and particularly technologies that involve use maps uh, today, like geographic information systems, GIS, like GPS. Um, and all the Google Earth and all the kinds of imagery that, that, that have become pretty much uh, mainstream. Um, and my goal with those technologies is really to highlight and to try to address disparity, geographic disparity. Um, why does where you live, say you grew up in Camden, say you grew up right here in North Philly, what does that help explain that you might die a few years earlier? Um, what is it about where we live and where we spend time? Um, and, and why is that so different across this great city? Um, and my goal is to, you know, I, I love the optimism about the city, but you know, we want, this has to be a great city for everybody. Um, and we have a ways to go um, on that. So, so what, can, what can these technologies do, um, do for us when it comes to understanding the city? So I, I teach in a city planning program. I'm, um, that's not my training. Um, but I've learned, and, and the city of Philadelphia is great at this, we've got a, a map layer for the streets, exactly where the streets are, exactly how wide they are. We've got a sidewalk layer. I mean, Jane Jacobs could have a lot of fun sort of mapping out all the great things that are happening on the sidewalk. Um, we've got building footprints, um, the outline of the building. So this is City Hall. It's a pretty cool looking building. Um, so we know exactly where all of our buildings in the city are. Um, and, and, and this is the visible city. This is when we walk around what we see. Um, pretty cool that we can make this 3D now. We can see just how tall those buildings are that Inga Safran is warning us. We don't necessarily need more of. Um, and more and more, we're combining this with aerial photographs, LIDAR technology, um, and, 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 and this, this once upon a time was magnificent, and now it's something that you just expect uh, when you go on, maybe even on your handheld, but certainly on the internet, that you'll be able to look at your city, look at the city that you're visiting. Um, and Google SketchUp is one of these tools that, um, that allows us in incredible de detail to, to, to model our city and to see it all configured together. Um, the city that I'm interested in is more the city that we don't see, and there's so much that we don't see. Um, so somebody from the water department is going to speak a little bit later about our sewer system. I mean, like, we are walking on top of all this magnificent sort of architecture underneath the city. Um, and these are the sewer inlets, the water inlets. And there's a map layer that shows where 85,000 of them are in the city. So you can map where all of those are. And I think of this like a portal to this whole other world that I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about. But there's these portals all over the city. So gas covers. I mean, when you go home today, just, just look at how many little covers there are that would, could take you into this world underneath. Not that I'm proposing that we all go underneath. But I mean, it'd be pretty cool, uh, at least to be able to do virtual travel. Um, there's for the water department, so gas, water, all this infrastructure, electric, telephone, um, all this stuff that's underneath our city. Um, and, and I think that it's absolutely fascinating. Um, there's a lot more that we can't see that, that really is the city. Um, and this is the stuff that I want to learn how to map. Uh, what used to be there? Um, some of you probably know Azavia, this wonderful local software firm um, that's, that's been involved in organizing this. Um, and they've helped the Department of Records build a couple of pretty cool applications. Uh, one is phillyhistory.org, where you can look at historic photographs of things that used to be. Um, Philadelphia didn't always look like this. Um, temple University didn't always have all these magnificent buildings. Yes, the temple, but not the other ones. What was there before? Um, and the other one is they've actually developed a an augmented reality application so you can look through your cell phone and you can see that historic photographs superimposed where it's supposed to be. Um, so this is part of what I'm interested in. What used to be here? Um, and then as Chris introduced, what used to be here is not just what, is not just the physical buildings. And I think the city that's interesting to all of us is the, the people that lived here, the people that used to live here. Uh, so Chris already mentioned that Du Bois came to Philadelphia just over 100 years ago um, at the inv invitation of the University of Pennsylvania, my employer, um, to study a neighborhood pretty much across Center City. And it was the heart of black Philadelphia. 
Um, and this is a map from his original book. It was this, uh, this beautiful color pull-out map. Um, and, it, and it sort of puts our GIS to shame. I mean, he had building footprints that were color-coded um, way before he had GIS or research assistants um, to do this. And he color-coded them all based on their social class status. So what would you be? Would you be middle class? Would you be working poor? Um, or who, who here would be vicious and semi-criminal? That was one of the vicious and criminal. That was one of the one of the groups. Um, but but it's a really important. This this map exists and is important testimony to um, to what happened um, back in that time period. So here's the legend, and I just stuck City Hall in there because it was built about that time. And you can see uh, we're not talking about we're talking about a black community in downtown Philadelphia. I think you guys know Philadelphia well enough to get it that this is not a black community um, anymore. Um, the other things that I'm interested um, in mapping um, are some of the processes that, that Spiral Q so elegantly um, and dramatically plays out for us. Um, I think we saw a lot of neighborhood change. Um, and neighborhood change not just happening because things change, but happening to people and happening to neighborhoods. Um, things like gentrification, or what we call around Penn, pentrification. I don't know what they call it at Temple, but they're going to have to come up with a word for it, and so is Drexel. Um, um, Yale spoke this morning about redlining. Um, so that's one of the processes that has shaped our city, um, not necessarily a welcome process. Um, this is a map that the Homeowners Loan Corporation created in the 1930s. Uh, and literally, the federal government for 239 cities across the country made a map that color-coded neighborhoods based on their real estate risk. Now, some people say this caused redlining. It was, it was more part of the phenomena of redlining. But you can see downtown Philadelphia in the middle, where the high-rises are. Of course, they weren't there then. All of, just about all of South Philly, all of North Philly, much of West Philadelphia was all colored red, which was hazardous. Um, so these are the kinds of things that I think are really interesting to map, and, and they present um, some new challenges. And here's just a, a, the legend for that. Um, and they came with these pretty awful, um, awful depictions of the neighborhood that the local realtors uh, and appraisers um, offered up. So beyond some of that kind of, um, I'm really interested, could we map um, emotions? Could we map memory? Um, could we map some of the good stuff, joy and health? in love, in fear, in grief, and hurt. Um, we know that we can map where everyone is murdered in Philadelphia. I mean, the police department could do it in five minutes. Um, but could you map the grief that comes from that? Um, and if you looked across the, the, the city, um, I know the people in my neighborhood you know, aren't going to have to use two hands to talk about people they knew who were shot. Um, but there are places in the, in the city of Philadelphia where people run, would run out of hands and toes uh, in talking about something like that. Um, so this is the kind of mapping that I think can be really transformative. Um, and I'm just going to pick a couple of these to talk about today. So, so one is talk about opportunity. Um, and I talked about just where you're born has a big impact um, on, on your experience, on, on your view, on what you see as being accessible to you. So one of the ways that we've, we've mapped this is, you know, kind of crude with cognitive maps. Okay, so here's where I live. That's where I take my son to daycare, and that's where I work. That's sort of my, my little world and sort of around there and um, I go out, I, I run through Woodland Cemetery maybe once a week, don't be impressed, you know. I slog through Woodland Cemetery uh, once a week. Um, but you know, that's sort of my stomping ground. Um, and um, you know, maybe a little more broadly, I sort of think of that as, as my world. But that's not really using all the power of the new technologies. And we've talked about crowdsourcing and we've been talking about some pretty cool things. Um, so, what I would like to do is figure out a way to use the technology to capture this. What's the difference of the experience of my son, um, my, my older son, who's three and a half, Isaac, um, and the opportunities that he sees in the world versus, let's say, a kid who's born um, in this neighborhood? Um, and the, the way that traditionally GIS, which of course was built for the defense industries and the business community and a lot of other sciences, not necessarily for addressing these kinds of issues, um, is really good at making, doing view shed analysis. So if they put one of those high rises up right on the, right on, um, along the, the waterfront in Philadelphia, we could see whose view is it blocking. Um, you know, not to make light of that, but that's not quite sort of the idea that I'm thinking about view and vision. Um, so I'm thinking maybe we could think about a, 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 um, an opportunity shed um, analysis or something that could think, you know, vision shed rather than just view shed um, with, with these kinds of tools. So um, here's Philadelphia region. Um, right in the middle is Philadelphia. Just put the highways in there to try to help orient you. And then, and then the suburban area. This is where my three and a half year old, most of his life <laughs> has taken place. Um, so he was born here in Philadelphia. And I just show sort of 
of the, the critical places um, are you know, our family places, so uh, where he goes to school, um, where he lives, um, and where he goes to grandma's house um, for, for daycare. And then all the red dots now are all the places I've ever taken him to eat or we've taken him to eat. And I don't know about you, anybody else have a three-year-old, four-year-old, two-year-old? You gotta be pretty careful about where you go. Um, and you gotta find a place that, that they can tolerate you and you can tolerate them. So uh, I, I swear we almost got kicked out of Chili's one night and it's pretty hard to get kicked out of Chili's. We always have fun, it's just a matter of if everybody else is, uh, is having fun. And we try to get in and out in 45 minutes, so that's one of the, that's one of the things. So that's, that's part of the distribution. And our friend network, and again, we're kind of careful about where we take our, you know, our kids to, for friend's house, if there's too many breakables and all. Um, uh, and then fun, so my kid comes home yesterday, you know, I was at work all day, and, and he'd gone to Tyler Arboretum with his grandmother. I've never been to Tyler Arboretum. I don't even know how to get to Tyler Arboretum. And he's shaking this piece of paper, and it's this coloring book page of a deer. I knew that they were going to talk about deer, and it's striped color. And he said, I said, well, what did you learn about today? He said, zebra deer. I was like, zebra deer, that is so cool. Did you see one? He's like, no, they hide, they hide. I was like, okay, <laughs> of course. I was like, that's like so cool. So my, kid, my kid's been to Lynn Villa, the aquarium, um, Morris Aubrey. I mean, he's been to a lot of great places. And these are just, these are our sort of local cultural organizations. Um, add in some of the institutions that have been an important part of his life, and then shopping. And here's a tip for any parents who haven't been to IKEA. IKEA, you can shop. Well, there's the daycare, but you can shop and you can eat. And there's no way they could kick you out of the cafeteria in Ikea for your kid cutting up. And when I taught on Thursday nights last year, or Tuesday nights, my husband would take my son to Ikea every like, night. That was like, that was their thing. Swedish meatballs, chicken fingers, french fries, juice boxes. They've got, they've got everything you need. Um, he's been on the subway system. He thinks the L's a little too loud. He likes the trolley better. Um, and he's been up here to this neighborhood um, to Church of the Advocate, this really great institution that's nearby. So if we think about all those spaces that he's been, and you know, I don't, it's a little bit harder to map probably your life. You've probably been in more than 150 places, which is what about I came up with for Isaac. But if we think about the whole Philadelphia region, and we think about just by income, like what's my kid been exposed to? And the way these view shed maps work is what can you see and what can't you see? So I'm gonna say around the areas where he's been, I'm gonna put little circles. Um, and sort of so you get to see where, where he's seeing, he, he, he's been to some areas that are high income, out in the suburbs. Um, he's been into some areas that are lower income, um, closer to our neighborhood and, and in North Philadelphia, and then just been some of the, the middle income areas. Um, what about other kids? You know, do, do kids have this, this, this sort of world experience? What about racial, ethnic um, experience? Um, so he, all these places he's been, um, so I should just explain, there's a the map shows uh, the color blue represents where African Americans live. The yellow, which is kind of a greenish yellow, represents where whites live, um, and then the, then the green is is Hispanic. So if I think about the areas that Isaac's been, um, you know, I grew up in New Hampshire, in a little town in New Hampshire. Um, there's fewer people in the state of New Hampshire than the entire city of Philadelphia, and there's not nearly the racial diversity. So just think about what my kid has been exposed to already in terms of racial diversity, predominantly black neighborhoods, predominantly white, and just about everything in between, um, which I think is exciting. And then think about more on the region. He's been to the lakes. He's been to the ocean. The kid goes to Cape May with his grandma. Um, you know, this kid's got a tough life. He's been, you know, to the mall in Washington. And I don't think that's even necessarily living, I mean, I think he's living a pretty privileged life. Um, but, you know, th th there's some really great things out there um, because he has these opportunities. Um, so I think the challenge for me is that I think, how can some of the technologies that I'm interested in help us to, to better model that and to model opportunity disparity um, among kids um, and how we could equalize that so that there's just as good a chance that my kid is up here on the the TEDx stage, you know, in 15 years, as the the kid who lives down the street on lives down Diamond Street, um, right nearby. So I talked about neighborhoods. Neighborhoods shape us, and we also shape our neighborhoods. You know, at least a little bit. And you know, I don't I don't have a great thought that I'm sort of radically changing my neighborhood in West Philadelphia. But you know, one day I was really pissed off. I was walking to Clark Park with my kid. He was like in my bat in the sack, and we're walking to Clark Park like we always do. And there's a Coke sign on a pole on the sidewalk next to the, the pizza place on the corner. And I was like, where did that come from? Like, like, you know, it's illegal, first of all, but it's also like annoying. Like, I don't want my, I mean, someday my kid will drink soda, but you know, not when he's six months. He doesn't need to know about Coca-Cola. Um, so we walked into the pizza place. We're like, what's the deal? I'm like, ah, the Coca-Cola distributor put it up. I was like, well, do you mind taking it down? Like, ah, whatever. So they did. I came back and it was gone. I was like, okay. So once in a while, like, you know, you, maybe you can do something to shape your neighborhood. I think that taking a, you know, a band of puppets, huge puppets down is probably a little bit more, um, but, um, 
my husband probably has an even more profound influence. I mean, he's a pretty quiet guy, um, and he'll probably be embarrassed that, that he got a shout out. Um, but my husband has already started putting up Christmas lights. I mean, he was on the roof November 1st. He's been planning it all year. We have twin. He does the next door neighbor's house. He, he was clearing the plan with her. And I mean, you could see it from Mars, but come down Larchwood Avenue, December 1st, after, anytime after Thanksgiving. It's like, you know, he's shaping his neighborhood. Um, I'm interested, you know, also in this reciprocal, how our neighborhoods shape us, um, this idea about the, the differential impact that they have. So what if we could map the places that um, all of our kids had been um, to, the, to the playgrounds? This is my son, Isaac. Um, and what if we could map all the ways that they had gone to the corner store um, and the foods that they had bought? Um, the 40 stops a big one in West Philly. So my kid likes chips, and I did have to take him into the store and buy him chips to, to do this. Well, Azavia, the company I mentioned, has actually helped me create this, Fed Up. Um, and and it's, a, it's an online application um, where you can pick your, uh, your homegirl chips up. Do you guys know homegirl chips? All right, all right. I, just in case you don't, I brought some. But you can't eat them. You can't eat them in here. Oh, sorry, I'll get you some. You can't eat them in here, OK? You got that memo, right? OK. Um, so just check out the back, that there's some foods that are only sold in these places. So if we could actually map where kids are going, we could start to understand um, how, how they're interacting with their environment. What I really like to do is you know, send them out with smartphones, send them out with uh, text messaging, um, so that they could actually start to, um, to, to, we could start to see how they interact. And what if we could actually start to change our environment? We could start to get rid of the advertising. And we could start to use augmented, to, augmented reality technologies to you know, not literally change our neighborhoods, but at least show people how how we would. I mean, I'd love to have you know, the food trust in front of every corner store, um, not, not to no slight to what they have been doing. Um, why can't we give our kids iPads? And again, this is my son Isaac. Um, and what if, like, what would Isaac do to the sidewalks? Well, maybe Isaac would make a dance, dance revolution, like all the way down the sidewalk. I don't know. I think that would be pretty decent. What about all those little portals down into the underground? Um, would he, um, would, could these be like part of the game? Um, and it, you know, it might sound kind of funny that we could kind of make a game everywhere we go. Um, but you know, the idea that people would stick technology in their face and like play, everybody just play tag, I mean, it sounds ludicrous, but everybody's walking down the street with their technology anyway. And Angry Birds, 400 million downloads, I mean, people don't mind sort of wasting their time playing you know, silly games. So why don't, we, why don't we do something to engage our kids? Maybe we put board, board games out. So this is a board game we made for the Du Bois project that, that Chris is talking about. Maybe we demand truth in advertising. So rather than the price on cigarettes, we could say, this is going to kill you. Or Nesquik, um, they, they, it says that it's low-fat chocolate milk, but there's 340 calories um, and 56 grams of sugar. So it's like, why do you even bother saying low-fat? You know, like, let's, let's just call it what it is. And I don't know how well this comes out, but what if we could scrub away the graffiti or get rid of the messages? This says tiny asshole gang on a wall in South Philadelphia. It's kind of sad, but if we could just wipe it out, and we could actually, kids could actually tell you what they're thinking. And this may not be what they're saying, but I'd say that's what every single kid who's been on this stage um, has been talking about. So I just want to end um, by reading a letter from some kids in West Philly. So what would they do if they could use these technologies to actually map out what's going on here? So um, this, is a, this is a letter from a kid who, who actually worked for me one summer. It said, hi, dear Dr. Hillier. Hi, I'm a teen from West Philly High, and we are trying to get to the bottom of redlining. I'm not making this up. This is a letter that I got in the mail at work in February. I'm not sure you remember me, but we work together. I'm trying to get to the bottom of redlining in West Philly. We want to try to solve this problem because we believe that it's highly disgraceful towards other ethnic groups. I mean, these are not kids who want to write tiny asshole gang on the wall. They're the kids who want to scream, you need to do, you need to do more for us. So maybe that this is what they do. They'd start to draw the red lines around the areas that have had this kind of historic um, um, inv disinvestment. So, you know, bottom line, my point is that we need to invest in all of our kids. I mean, I, I want the best for my son, Isaac. I want the best for Mateen. Um, and, 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 and we need to invest in our neighborhoods, but we also need to invest in our kids. We need to listen to our kids. Um, and we need to love them um, because all of these kids um, are our kids. Tag, you're it.